Thank you, Gina. That's a very nice introduction. I've called it the continuing quest, mm -hmm. continuing search, because I've been doing it for a long time, as you can see. Almost 30 years I've been involved in motor neuron disease research. And uh, we think we're getting somewhere. It's, it's a slow, pro slow progress, but we're getting there. And we've got new tools. Uh, what you've heard a bit about the genetics, uh, the tools on the genetics, which is very exciting. Uh, there are new uh, clinical ways of managing MND, which you've heard something about that as well. And I'll talk mostly about uh, the risk factors in the environment. And you might think that genetics is complex. It is complex because there are actually six billion little bits of DNA information that can go wrong in, in any of us. So it's huge, six billion, if you think about it. If you think the universe is only 3.5 billion years old, the six billion base pairs is a lot. So genetics is complex, but it's doable. And it's being done by these huge consortia uh, that you've heard about and international collaborations and <coughs> huge computers. And it's, it's, it's going to be done in the next few years, I suspect. There's another layer, as you've probably also heard, epigenetics, which is a little bit more complex, and there may be other layers we don't know about yet. But uh, the technology is there for the genetics, and uh, it's funny, in a way, if you, we used to think having a, a mutated gene was a bad thing, but in a way, almost, that's a hopeful thing now, because with uh, gene technology, you've heard of CRISPR technology, things like that. If you've actually got an identifiable gene that's faulty, the, the possibilities are there for future treatment in the not too distant future, I suspect. I suspect people are already doing uh, experiments. They're certainly doing them in animals. Uh, but the old idea was that there were sort of two types of motor neurons, old being like 10 years ago, not so long ago, that there were two types of motor neuron disease. There was the familial, ran in families, it was genetic, that was about 10%. And then in 90% of people, no other family member involved, even if you have a huge family, man, many generations, and that was thought to be non-genetic, that was sporadic, maybe something in the environment. But okay. as, again, as you've heard earlier today, I'm sure, that those two, sort of, those are the two far edges of MND, and most people now think that Everybody with motor neuron disease has some genetic component and some environmental component. So even though you've got no family history, you've had all your gene tests done, you've even had a whole genome scan done, people think there's still a genetic susceptibility there that's still to be found. It gets a bit complex because uh, as Nim told you, uh, there's this six-step hypothesis now that's been it's fairly well, well, reasonably established over a number of uh, investigators that there are probably five or six steps that you need before you get MND. <coughs> and unfortunately, we don't know if one of those is genetic and five of those are environmental, or if it's half and half, what the ratio is. So it's, it, it's, it's complex. So most of the work so far in motor neuron disease the research work, in fact, has been done on the genetic side because uh, that's where uh, it's doable. We can get the DNA, you can do it. And it's difficult, but it will be done. The environmental side, not so much. Largely because if you think of an industrial world, there are thousands of potential toxins out there that could be poisoning your motor neuron disease. We produce something, Jane's a toxicologist, she's a trained toxicologist, she's a doing a PhD on our uh, risk factor study at the moment. And she'll probably tell you, I think it's about uh, a 1,000 new chemicals, I forget, a month come on the market. And so they're entering the atmosphere, et cetera. So it's really hard to keep up. So in fact, finding risk factors in the environment for ALS, for motor neuron disease, <coughs> has been very difficult. And there hasn't been one that has really stood out. Uh, so far. I mean, we know a number, I mean, in familial motor neuron disease, about half the people now we can find a, a genetic problem, uh, but we still can't find the environmental. So that's going to be, I think, it's going to be the next big 
challenge for motor neuron disease re research is finding these environmental factors. I suspect that in people with sporadic motor neuron disease that we're going to find that of those six steps, a lot of them are going to be risk factors, some toxins, viruses, who knows. In people with familial motor neuron disease, it's going to be mostly genetic, but it's going to be two or three risk factors in the environment. For example, you can have the same gene mutation in a family. Someone can get motor neuron disease at 20 years old, and uh, you think, oh, that's it's only the one person in the family, and then you finally one of the parents can get it later at 70 years old. So again, you think it's not just the gene, even if it's in a family, there's something triggering it. So the saying is, you've probably heard, that uh, your genes load the gun, and the environment pulls the trigger. So you've got, you've got it there. You could have the genetic susceptibility. If you're not exposed to the environmental things, you'll never get MND. If you are, unfortunately, you will. So we're hoping to find uh, more about this, and there are two or three ways you can do it. Firstly, uh, you can look, in, uh, look at people's blood and hair and cerebrospinal fluid and look for, for different <coughs> toxins in there. That's unfortunately a bit it's possible. People have done it along. We've done it. Uh, it's difficult because MND could have begun in fact, your risk factor, your environmental risk factor, could have been 10, 20, 30 years ago. You might have got it in, could have stayed in the motor neuron only, and so you do a blood test, it's not there. That's, oh, it's not selenium or whatever you want to say, but in fact, it's still in, in the motor neuron itself. And then people have looked, including ourselves, have looked uh, at people who have donated their CNS tissue, their, their brain and spinal cords after death, and we have looked for the toxins in the nervous system. The difficulty there is that by the time someone dies of motor neuron disease, they've lost most of their motor neurons. And so you can look there and you can't see the, the, the motor neuron that would have had the toxin, in fact, has gone, unfortunately, so you can't see. Also, motor neurons, as they get injured, actually take up environmental toxins more, so it could be a secondary effect. So there are two other ways of doing it. Uh, one is to look at uh, people who don't have motor neuron disease and see where uh, toxins are getting into their nervous system, because then we can see at post-mortem exactly where they are, because they haven't lost their motor neurons. We're doing that at the moment. I think we have a paper coming out in a couple of weeks' time on that. That could be interesting. Um, and then you can look at people's past experiences, and that's what our main thrust is. And so that's why we had a, a motor neuron disease questionnaire. 12 years ago, we started it, a paper-based questionnaire. Some of you might have done it, maybe, in the past. And we took a blood sample for uh, DNA, and we set up the DNA, Australian MND DNA Bank, which is now <coughs> being used for Project Mine and things like that, for whole genome, which so it's wonderful how it's all taken off. But um, unfortunately, one of the problems with these questionnaires is you're looking at a fairly small population, Australia, you know, 20 million people. And so uh, you really want to look at, try to get an international comparison going. And the risk factors in one country might be different from the risk factors in Japan or whatever. So we thought the way of doing this was to go online. And so that's where Jane came in, because I'm an old bloke and you need somebody under the age of 30 who understands computers. So Jane's wonderful. So she has set up this, um, this questionnaire uh, using a, a special platform. And some of you may have done it. So I'll be very interested to hear more about that later, if you've done it or not, uh, any problems you've had. And so that asks a number of questions. If you've done the questionnaire, you might think, why am I being asked this? Uh, but they all have a point. We got a lot of help from around the world, from the Europeans, from the US, because everybody has their own questionnaires. We've got everybody else's questionnaires. We looked which are the best questions, put it online. You can now do it in 20 different languages. And so we've got a lot of help. Although we have mostly from Australia, we've got a lot of people from the US, from Canada have done it, from Spain. And so we're going to be able to see not only are these environmental risk factors important for Australia, but how robust are they? 
do the Americans have the same, do they have the same types of occupations that have been suggested to um, be more at risk of ALS than others, for example? Have they had the same amount of exercise? You know, there's a very controversial, is exercise a risk factor for ALS, for motor neuron disease? Uh, or is it protective? And so uh, if you've done the questionnaire, you'll send all these different questions. So it's been going about uh, just over a year now, Jane, the question? Year, year and a half, yeah. And we've got a nice number of people, about 700 people have, have done it, which is nice. We want 10,000. <laughs> we'll get there, because this is going around a long time, this question. These, our previous questionnaire takes 10 years. So you really need large numbers. You actually need, quite for the statistics, uh, you need a, l a large number of people for really nice, robust findings. So many of the past risk factor questionnaires have been done on small numbers of people, and the results are all over the place. So you just got to be patient and, and do it. Uh, we're going to put out some um, papers. Jane's preparing them at the moment, some early ones. Um, and we're just waiting now for the numbers. <coughs> And so one of the things I was hoping today is, of course, to promote the questionnaire, ALS Quest. It's uh, online, it's anonymous. Uh, yes, people have got uh, bookmarks. So we've got the bookmarks that whenever you open your book, you feel guilty. I haven't done the questionnaire. <laughs> the nice thing is, if I ask you, you can say, yes, I've done it, because I won't know. It's anonymous. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't know who's done it. Uh, we, we don't ask your neurologist for details. We'll ask you to self-report. It's been shown that people with motor neuron disease, very accurate, over 90% accuracy. There does a study in the States showing if you think you've got ALS and then they go to your neurologist, yes, you've got ALS. So we're going to get good data. And, uh, so, and we've been very encouraged from the, and the overseas, um, overseas uh, people who've done it for us. We even having it done in Mongolian. We've got somebody from Mongolia translating it for us at the moment. They've got an ALS association in Mongolia. And uh, what we do is we've had medical students help us because medical students have many different languages and so they've helped us translate the uh, questionnaire. Uh, so it's, it's come up quite nicely. So what I would like to do, and in fact, just before I finish, one of the uh, things we're particularly interested in, uh, if you've done the questionnaire, you'll see it's, uh, why do you think you've got motor neuron disease? And uh, we pay very close attention to that. One of the things you might think are a bit strange, the number of personality type questions, what type of personality you are. And for many years, it's been suggested that people who get motor neuron disease have a different personality. In fact, people often ask at conferences, are people with ALS actually nicer than other people? <laughs> They've said maybe if you can find the gene for niceness, the gene for ALS will be just next door. But uh, no, it's a serious question. Yes. And uh, so we're interested in that because your personality uh, determines what sort of job you have and what sort of activities you do. So we're very interested in this. And it's never been looked at seriously. So we've teamed up with a, the professor of psychology at Sydney University. She helped us get together these questionnaires for personality. And so, and in fact, we've got some very interesting preliminary results, uh, which Jane is very keen to publish. <laughs> but uh, I'm telling you, just a few more numbers we need. In fact, we need particularly men who don't have ALS. That's the big. That's the big uh, deficit. So any men here who don't have ALS, I'm looking at you. And uh, ladies, if, you're, if, if you have ALS and your partner uh, hasn't done the questionnaire, you can say, uh, no, don't buy me flowers for uh, my birthday or, or give me a present at Christmas. Do the questionnaire. That'll be the best present you can give. We're also very interested in stress. For I ran the motor neuron disease clinic at Prince Alfred Hospital for many years. And patients often said to me, listen, I've had a very stressful time the last few years before I got uh, motor neuron disease. I lost my job or my partner died or something happened, something <coughs> terrible. And in fact, I was interested, but I always thought, you know, this is what they call recall bias. Something bad happens to you 
and you, you relate it to something else bad that happens to you. It's a, it's a well-known trait. But then I think the more you think about uh, stress um, and the more we're learning about it and what it does to the body, the more interesting that's becoming. And it's been people with multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's have had the same research question. Does a, a period of stress over a few years actually prime your nervous system to be damaged by environmental toxins or whatever? So we've, uh, if you've done the questionnaire again, you'll see there's, a, in fact, there's a standard ways of measuring stress, which is quite, quite funny because um, one of them is, uh, have you recently had a vacation, a holiday, you know, because uh, so things like this, because I think especially blokes sometimes feel vacations are a bit stressful. But, uh, and they, they, they get certain points for various things you've had in the last year. You'll have seen them. Anyway, my, my wife was very really amused to see that. <laughs> stressful for me. And so uh, maybe a period of stress at the time will weaken your system to toxin. There's a little... I don't want to get too technical, but there's a little part of the brain called the locus ceruleus, it means the blue spot, mm. that uh, actually uh, determines your response to stress. When you're stressful, the locus ceruleus says it directs your brain to what you should do to escape the stress. With the target coming towards you, the locus ceruleus integrates everything into it, run in that direction or whatever. And uh, we have found that, in fact, the locus ceruleus is the area of the brain that takes up toxins more than any other area, which is very interesting. We can stain for mercury, for example, as my particular interest is mercury. And so we thought this would fit in nicely with the stress you're taking up because <laughs> what happens if the locus ceruleus becomes damaged is the, your blood-brain barrier. Usually there's a barrier between the blood and the brain. Your toxins can't get through. So if, you know, I'll give you bismuth or mercury or something, it doesn't get through. If your blood-brain barrier is damaged, it can then get through to the nervous system. So if the locus ceruleus is damaged, maybe that's why. So we've, we've been following this up for a while and looking at people who have died of MND, and in fact they do have quite a lot of mercury in the locus ceruleus. So this might all fit in together with stress, toxin, psychology. So that's why we uh, this is one of the reasons we have these rather unusual questions that nobody else has asked before in, um, in our questionnaire. So I'd like to throw it open now, if that's okay. And uh, just, I'd very much like to think what you think of might be stressful or environmental risk factors that you've had, and maybe we can talk about this. A number of people are doing questionnaires, so there's quite a lot of uh, knowledge about it. Yes, madam. I think there's a roving mic. Wait for the microphone down in the front here. Anyone else? So we can know where to go next. Yep. <coughs> Sorry. I was at a talk the other day, and uh, this chap was saying whenever he asks questions, he he takes up the Buddha position. You know, the Buddha is very calm, and he would just stand there calmly, this is for students, you know, because students never like to ask questions because they think they look stupid. And you just sit, nothing happens, you can stay there for 10, 15 minutes and eventually the question starts. <laughs> so I'm glad I don't have to do that today. <laughs> um, my dad has ALS and he's convinced that it might be related to his breathing and metal bridges that he had put in while ago, so he wants to take the fillings out. So your father had <clears throat> ALS and he had metal like bridges or dental work? Bridge dental work, yep. yes. So that, that might have caused it. Yes, yes, I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, well, you know, that's, that's been a, a thought for a while. As you know, uh, dental fillings, silver fillings are 50% mercury. Uh, and um, especially if you chew and things, you breathe in quite a lot of mercury. It's been quantitated. You can actually measure the amount of mercury. It's small. Uh, but it, it's significant. <coughs> Most people handle mercury. Mercury is, you know, if uh, <coughs> talking about mercury were an Olympic sport, I'd be on the podium, I must say, because <laughs> I can talk about mercury for a long time, so I won't go, I won't wrap it on too long. But mercury is very interesting because not only do a lot of people have uh, amalgam fillings, I've got eight of them myself, 
which is the average in Australia, and the, before the flu, before fluoride became came in the water, and uh, it's been thought of for a long time. The epidemiology hasn't been strong. They take a thousand people with who've had fillings and a thousand people who didn't, they'll have virtually the same amount of ALS. Uh, in fact, there's more mercury in the atmosphere. There's a thing called the mercury cycle. Uh, even if, a, if it's a factory in China that's pouring out mercury on Japan, it enters the, enters the atmosphere, circulates around the world, and then gets into the water and uh, soil. So we all have about the same amount of mercury, which makes it a very popular toxin. Uh, for neurodegenerative disease, because then if you just have a genetic susceptibility to mercury and the 11 genes we know of that control how you handle mercury, because we've been exposed to toxins for a long time. If maybe one of those was had a, a mutation, maybe you'd get it. So uh, that's what, uh, in fact, we're doing, about to do this at the moment. We're looking at uh, our um, patients who have died and we've, um, we know how much mercury they've got in their brains, and we've also done whole genome analysis. So we're doing a gene environment study to see if they've got the genetic susceptibility. <clears throat> so it's a very respectable idea, um, but hard to prove, hard to prove. It'd be interesting to know because in Australia, if, if, if I live long enough, you know, people, there are fewer and fewer mercury fillings, I don't know, probably everybody under the age of 40 here doesn't have any, or very few. It's just because of fluoride. It would be interesting to see if the incidence of MND went down. If anything, it's, it might be going up. I'm not too sure. Alzheimer's disease is going down. But I think uh, it's very controversial. But MND, I think, is staying the same way, if anything, going up. So uh, yes, a lot of people have been given this a lot of thought. Should, should he get them taken out? I don't think so. Once, um, <clears throat> once, once heavy metals are in motor neurons, they stay there. And they're in little membranes called lysosomes. And we're protected. We all, almost all of us, have some mercury in our bodies, we, we're finding on our studies. Uh, but most of us, it doesn't matter. Trouble is, if you have them taken out, you release actually quite a lot of mercury just at the time. And who knows what? the, amount, the uh, composites they're putting in, we don't know how safe they are as well. So it's probably best left alone, yeah. My husband has um, MD and, and there were three factors that we were wondering why they had an effect. One is he drove 22,000 kilometers around Australia last year mm -hmm. and it was very windy with a caravan that was hard to pull along. Mm -hmm. He's a woodwork teacher. He's a, sorry, what sort of teacher? Woodwork, industrial yes. arts teacher. Yes. And a lot exposed to uh, a lot of um, wood fibers mm -hmm. and dust. Um, and he had, what's the disease you get when it was chicken pox, but what is it when you're old? Shingles. Shingles, Shingles yeah. We <laughs> had that a few years ago too. Very cellar sauce. Some of them are stress. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, so your, your first Sorry. comment was about the, uh, the, the driving. The driving. The stress, yeah. Uh, well, of course, driving uh, is stressful. That's poss possible. Also, was it a, a, a normal, was it a diesel car or a...? Yes, diesel. Diesel. And it's his right leg that was the one that went first. Oh, OK. Well, anyway. I hate to promote our own work, but in fact, I don't know if you saw, a couple of years ago we wrote a paper and we looked at all the occupations that uh, people might <coughs> have had who, in an Australian study, this is when we're using our paper-based questionnaire, and we looked at all the ones people who, who had motor neurons who didn't. We had a nice number of controls, equal number of controls. We had about uh, 1,400 people. So it was a nice size study. And <clears throat> the, the one occupation that came out so strongly was truck drivers. <coughs> truck drivers. In, and in fact, we went back and we thought, oh, that's funny. Is that a statistical aberration? You know, the stat people gone. <clears throat> and then we went back to 1980 and an American study, an overlooked study also, 
Ours was the biggest study at the time. This was the second biggest. Also showed truck drivers. <coughs> so we thought, why well, truck drivers? And you can say, oh, truck drivers, they often smoke a lot, and maybe they're taking substances to keep them awake, and they're a bit overweight, and this and that. But of course, uh, most trucks were diesel. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> diesel has now been uh, shown to be dangerous for a number of things cancers, etc. The number of different parts of diesel fuel depends on the type of diesel fuel. And so we just wondered if diesel might uh, be a <coughs> precipitating factor for MND. Diesel were also used a lot in the army, tanks and all those things. And as you know, if you've ever fought in a war, you're more likely to get motor neuron disease, especially the Gulf War in the US, Iraq. So we wondered if that wasn't a link. And then we looked at all the other occupations that had a link not as strong as truck driving, and 80% of them had diesel use yeah, as well. So it's all just correlation. You know, the thing about if you, something's a correlation doesn't mean it causes it, but you thought that was quite interesting. So that's a possibility. <coughs> and we think maybe if you're exposed to diesel or something like it and you're stressed at the same time and your system's weakened, that's when you get it. So uh, was it a stressful trip, was it? I was very windy the whole way, and the caravan windy. had an accident, so it was oh. had to be written off at the end of the. Oh, gee, yeah. so sounds like <laughs> holiday from hell. <laughs> yeah. Did you hear the uh, the, the caravan uh, had to be written off and uh, very windy? Yes. So these are all uh, things, and so we're going to be very interesting with our online questionnaire, and that was just in Australia. The nice thing about the online questionnaire, we'd be able to see if. It's also a risk factor in the US, if it's a risk factor in Czechoslovakia, all the different countries that we've got. I think we cover about 80% uh, now of countries, do we, Jan, with our, our languages? Yeah, at least. So, yeah, we're, and we're getting Russians coming in soon and uh, Arabic and that sort of thing. So we're going to get uh, all the countries. So we'll be able to see if, it's, if that's robust, not just Australia. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my question is about the food that we eat today yes. from the supermarkets. There's a lot more preservatives, additives, gases to <coughs> keep the apples greener, etc. Yes. Could that have any link at all? Very good question. <coughs> Very, and it's been looked at in MND, <coughs> but not very well. The problem is food questionnaires are very difficult. We, we've got a very simple one in our questionnaire. You, and uh, so, in fact, you ha you're asking people, what have you eaten, basically, over the last 10 years? And uh, I can't remember what I had yesterday for breakfast. <laughs> so it's, it's quite hard. And uh, often we don't know what's in the food. You know, who looks at those tiny E72 and that sort of thing? So it's been very difficult. There are a number of prospective studies. So they're following people now and then seeing, you know, follow them over the years prospectively. That might be uh, that might give us some answers, but retrospectively, it's been uh, very difficult to do food. Yeah. Jane, have you come across any food. Uh, on food? Not for MND. No, okay, no, not. For, yeah. There hasn't been a good one done in MND, but it's certainly possible. I mean, who? You know, <coughs> all the, those editors <coughs> we yeah, we only find out in ten years' time sometimes. If uh, yes. <coughs> have you noticed, like in your studies, is do you have a high proportion of the people that have anxiety disorders or OCD or mm. that sort of thing? And have you got any twins? Yes, we do have. Uh, we do ask. In fact, we have a. Uh, it's got an unfortunate name. It's called the geriatric anxiety inventory. It's not actually meant for geriatric people, it was meant just for adults, because a lot of work has been done on uh, adolescents and children with anxiety disorder, but very little on actually on adults. And there's a nice Australian inventory, so that's part of our questionnaire. We will be able to answer that when we get uh, some more numbers. The numbers are a bit small. Trouble with uh, questionnaires is that you, you think, oh, I've got a thousand people, but then you break it down into men and women and different ages, so you get into quite small numbers at that. Once we get to our numbers, we'll get that. But uh, I'd be interested to find out, but we can't answer that yet. 
yes. And sorry, your other question? Any twins. Twins, yes. <clears throat> twins, I'm particularly interested in twins because um, we've been following, I know Kelly's been following twins genetically, so did we. <clears throat> uh, we over 10 years we managed to get five pairs of twins, one of whom had motor neuron disease and the other one who didn't. And in fact, if you take a hundred sets of, these are identical twins now, so they should have exactly the same genes, uh, the great majority, if one person gets ALS, the other one doesn't. They've got all the same genes, but they don't get it, usually, 80%. You only got a 20% chance, even they've got the same genes, which I think is quite strong evidence for a bit of something in the environment. <coughs> and so uh, we, are we looking at the epigenome now and other things at the moment on them? And we've looked at their questionnaires. The interesting thing about those twins was they were very similar. They often had the same occupations. They lived in the same, they often lived in the same house together. But that one got MND and the other one didn't. Mm -hmm. So it's a, still a big mystery, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a particular interest in twins yourself? Oh, no, I'm just, just curious because I was <coughs> thinking about what you're trying to do. I was thinking, yes. well, it'd be good if you had a whole swag of twins. Yes, yes. <laughs> swag is hard. Swag would be nice. But uh, twins, what, 1 in 80 uh, versus a twin, isn't it? And MNDs. It's not uncommon, but it isn't all that common. So it's quite hard to get to get twins. Yeah, we were lucky to get five. Yeah. And I know they're doing a huge research in the states on twins, and they've been going for it's been going for quite yes. a long time. Yes, yes. I was wondering if you could get me. Yes, part of that. yeah. And we, we've got a twin registry here as well in Australia, but they didn't have any alias. So we prospectively over ten years we managed to. And I, know, I think Dominic Rose now is interested in twins and he's collecting them as well. So we will find more answers to those. Yes. Hi, Prof. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between the genetic and the epigenetic information. Yes. Yeah. Um, Yes. <clears throat> uh, you mean, uh, so what is the common denominator? Have there been anything that sort of popped out, I think you're saying, at the moment? Exactly. I don't think so. <clears throat> well, I don't think so. I mean, if, if you look at, I mean, we're all doing, you know, I mean, sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, so if you look at those 700 people, it's a, it's a, it's almost around 300 of those have MND and 400 do not. So those 400 make up our control group. And so, um, you know, what we do is then we can compare the two. So in terms of things that, um, you know, are more common in that MND group uh, in comparison to the control group, um, you know, I think we ask very broad questions about things like specific metals, like if somebody's been exposed to a specific metal or pesticides, um, and you think, or smoking. So we kind of have some of these, what we call dichotomous um, exposures, where it's kind of a yes or no thing, where you either have been exposed, you're either considered to be exposed or not exposed. And so some of the things that come up are not, um, not unexpected. Um, like lead and mercury and pesticides. So um, again, we don't necessarily have the numbers to make any definitive like statements about any particular uh, risk factors like those. But um, you know, those are the ones that have that have sort of come up in the initial assessment. So we yes. have to see how it goes. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, in our previous questionnaire. Uh, Smoking, you know, smoking was considered to be a established risk factor for MND, and we had a big study in Australia, and it just wasn't. There was no difference, no difference. So you can light up again. <laughs> Is this being recorded? <laughs> oh, okay. But uh, yeah, and it's, it's trending that way with our new questionnaire as well. It's very similar. So that's, and that shows the importance of having the same questionnaire done in different countries. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, in our previous questionnaire, herbicides, pesticides exposure, you were six times more likely if you were in an occupation that was exposed, like farmers, etc. 
the difficulty with all those types of questions, uh, and that's why I need big numbers, is the thing called recall bias. If you've got a terrible disease and you're doing a questionnaire, you really think hard, gee, was I really exposed to a pesticide? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you didn't get it as a control, less. The good thing about our questionnaire, I would don't want to put you off doing it if you haven't done it. It's quite long. <laughs> it takes about 90 minutes. It's like going to a movie. You can do it in multiple sessions, you know, and it's saved by itself. And uh, so don't get me wrong, it's doable. So if you do it 10 minutes a day for a week, you've done it. But our new questionnaire, because it's quite long, only people, people who finish it are going to be pretty uh, good on detail as well. So we're going to get, I think, a much better group of comparisons this time. So we're going to be able to tell in a reasonably short time, especially because it's international now, uh, we're going to be able to get back to you on that. But nothing with our present questionnaires really popped up as well. And in previous, you know, we're not the only people who do questionnaires, of course. Previous questionnaires, as Jane says, uh, people have asked for specific things, you know, selenium, have you been exposed? Who knows half the time? You know, you go to work, you don't know what you're exposed to half the time. So we look at occupation, and that's going to be interesting, actual occupation, to see if we can get what we found before, things like truck drives and things. And then you can dig deeper into that occupation to see what they might be exposed to. Okay, yeah, so my brother just got recently diagnosed with ALS. Um, he's an architect, uh, he's 33. Um, we're wondering, like, we thought maybe he got exposed to blue-green algae, um, which he did mm -hmm. in a water mm -hmm. laboratory. He may have had exposure to that. It's also broken a lot of bones. I don't know if that's another one mm -hmm. of the questions. Mm -hmm. um, yep, that's, uh, that is one of our questions, previous trauma. So the question was, um, is, is blue-green algae a possibility? Uh, interesting, he's an architect. In our previous questionnaire, we found that in fact, the, uh, there's an occupational ranking as to skills and um, experience that you have going from one to seven. So if you're a CEO or whatever, something, you know, a high court judge and to unemployed on the other end. And the people uh, with motor neuron disease were more likely to be uh, manual workers and uh, so we think maybe you're then more exposed to toxins and things. Whereas if you're sitting in a nice office in Pitt Street, you know, you're not going to be exposed to much. We worked at a water hydraulics laboratory for a couple of years. Uh, Sorry, what's that? We worked at a water hydraulics laboratory for a couple of years. Oh, yes, years. yes, um, yes. That's the challenge with, uh, with uh, questionnaires, is you need timing as well. So a lot of people in our previous question, there, one person had 13 occupations, and you have to put it in ranks. So that's quite tricky. Blue-green algae is, has been suggested. Very difficult to people. There are good people in Australia and the US and France who are looking at this. Uh, difficult to know. Again, who knows if you're exposed. Could have been 30 years ago. You could have gone swimming in a lake somewhere. Very hard. But they're trying, yeah. We've got a, a, a short thing in our questionnaire about uh, swimming, et cetera, and living at a lake, but yeah. Other people are doing it in more depth. Trouble with questionnaires is you, you, can, you can only ask a certain amount because there's just fatigue, you know, you can't do. A good dietary questionnaire will take you a whole day to do. So you've got to be practical as well and, and go for what you think are going to be the main risk factors. I think my question might have been um, answered. Mine was sort of along the blue green algae line, but also yes. just waterways in general. So um, two of my family members that do all have done a lot of water skiing have passed away um, from MND. So, and it's a genetic um, strain. So we didn't know whether maybe there was something in oh, yeah. the waterways yeah, yeah. Enough, that was covered in the study. Yes. So the question was uh, somebody who had familial MND in the family and a number of the family members didn't live near waterways that had blue-green algae. Could that be a, a problem? It's certainly up there, yeah. It's people have looked at the toxins from blue-green algae and they do poison motor neurons. The trouble is motor neurons are such complex cells that they can get po they're very sensitive to lots of things. So just because it poisons, it doesn't mean that it is. Uh, and I think the jury's still out on blue-green algae, but there's a big group of people who think that it's, it's one of the possibilities, yeah, one of the six steps maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, yeah, thank you. Um, my husband has MND and uh, dementia as well with it. Yes. And quite severely now. Um, and with my observations of his previous life, uh, if you, you know, six risk factors, the main one I would think for him and other people I've seen with it is heat, just simple overheating of the brain, which would tie in with people with diabetes, the people with um, fevers, hard hat wearing, working in the heat, mm. and he would never worry about a hat. He was always out there. He would work in incessantly, you know, a real, what do you call it, you know, driven person, and also plenty of blue algae in his life as well, but um, mm. just the pure heat, I mean, it, to me, it could be like skin cancer in that some people have more risk for it, and once you get exposed with the ultraviolet for skin, but for your brain, it could simply be just the overheating of some sort. Is that, is that being looked at? That's a very good question, you know, that's why I like these sessions. I've never thought of that before. Uh, could heat be a risk factor for motor neuron disease? People have looked at sunlight, which is a bit different, of course, uh, as a risk factor, as you know, for multiple sclerosis, it seems to be not having enough sun is a risk factor and not having enough vitamin D. That's also been looked at a lot, vitamin D and sunlight in MND, and we've got a question about that indirect question in our questionnaire. So we might be able to tell. I think epidemiologically, you know, people have looked for multiple sclerosis, for example, it's, you're much more likely, the further away you are from the equator, you're more likely you are to get multiple sclerosis. So if you live in Scandinavia, if you live in Tasmania, you're much more likely to get it than living in Queensland. And that might be related to a little bit of heat as well, but that's never been shown. So geographically, you imagine for hot countries, you would imagine there'd be more people having motor neuron disease, but I don't think that's ever been shown. Yeah. But um, I would think, in, I'm thinking of you know, like fevers where you get a, a spurt of intensity <coughs> rather than just being warm. So could it be like internal heat rather than uh, fevers yeah. rather than, yeah, it's a possibility. I mean, we have um, special proteins to deal with heat. They're called heat shock proteins. And, uh, they're they of, of some interest in uh, a number of diseases, heat shock proteins. So yeah, that's an interesting thought. Unfortunately, we can't change our questionnaire now because it's <laughs> so, But uh, maybe the next one, heat. Huh? I'll, I'll, keep an, I'll keep an eye out for that and have a little search. It's a very interesting thought. Thank you. I don't know if you can answer this question, but all these things that you've mentioned that could contribute to ALS yes. are still here now for those who do have ALS. Does that have an impact on our progression? That's another very good question. Uh, not only could these risk factors be a trigger factor, but could it also influence progression? I just do not know. I don't know if it is known. I don't think it is. And there's no reason why it shouldn't. Yes. I say the longer the answer, the less you know about <laughs> the question. But that's very interesting. I'm just trying to think of a model that you could use to test that. Unfortunately, we don't know the initial trigger to begin with. I mean, having MND itself is stressful. Yes. So, I mean, yes. Well, in fact, you know, we, we're doing a big study at, uh, of this nucleus I'm interested in. In uh, Interesting that you should mention, I was just thinking about this the other day. Uh, across a whole range of people uh, who have died from many different causes, looking at the amount of mercury in this nucleus called the locus ferus, the stress nucleus. And the person who had the most mercury was someone who had Huntington's disease, which is a genetic condition. There's, so there's no reason to think that mercury caused his hunting. We know it's a gene, causes the disease, nothing else. But it's, it makes you very stressed having Huntington's disease. So I think he was taking up mercury. Once you've taken it up, you can then damage your blood-brain barrier. So <coughs> it's a very nice idea. MND as well? It's theoretically possible, yes, yes. Because I mean, the blood-brain barrier has been suggested to be damaged in motor neuron disease. Basically, you've got to be stress-free, so how do we do that? <laughs> Less stress. <laughs> That's right, mindfulness, yeah. Um, you, 
You do need a bit of stress, don't you, to cope with, uh, cope with daily life, to get going. They call it the J-curve, don't they? It's really, you need a certain amount and then too much is bad for you. But uh, yes, we should be able to know. Our stress questions have been timed in our questionnaire. So we ask what sort of time in your life you were stressed and also what you were doing, what occupation you had at the same time. So if you were a, a minor, and you were stressed at that time, we say, oh, well, maybe you were stressed, you were pulling in more toxins from the mining, etc. So we'll have a, uh, an idea of that. But that's a very nice question, but, and uh, again, I'll need to look into it more.